So welcome everyone um, to uh, what's going to be a really interesting Grand Rounds and discussion. Really excited to have Chris Lim, Dr. Chris Lim here with us today, who is someone uh, that actually a number of us have gotten to know. And he's been, uh, if you can believe it, while doing his residency, has done a little uh, consulting work uh, for our team. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how that would even happen in a sec. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking with us about something I think really important, care management and behavioral health care. So I'm just going to, uh, before introducing him, let people know yet again um, that uh, if you have um, questions along the way, uh, don't hesitate to put those in the chat and I will curate them. We'll switch over to a, a Q&A around one and, uh, and you can put your uh, questions again in the chat or uh, uh, raise your hand or unmute. So let me just uh, tell you uh, briefly about Dr. Lim, who is um, a fourth year psychiatry resident, although that's almost at its end, at Cambridge Health Alliance, uh, used to be called Cambridge Hospital when I did my training there, and a clinical fellow in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on novel models of behavioral health care. He was a finalist for the 2021 Harvard Medical School Department of Psychiatry Solomon Award. He previously served as a senior advisor for Aetna, Medicare, and CVS Health. Dr. Lim graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College and earned his MD from Harvard Medical School. Um, he didn't note it in his bio, but in between there, he actually spent, I think, a couple of years at the New England Conservatory of Music getting a master's of music in classical piano. He is the author of, uh, at, a, at a, an early career stage, uh, the author of 13 peer reviewed papers, including first author publications in psychiatric services, academic psychiatry, schizophrenia research, psychodynamic psychiatry, and the Journal of Palliative Medicine. Um, and just a couple of a further notes on uh, Dr. Lim, who I uh, see as I do a number of the kind of uh, up and coming cohort of, of leaders in psychiatry, including folks in, on this call, as being part of really solving um, these huge problems that we have uh, ahead of us in the, in the not too distant future, in fact, in the present with this sort of tsunami of, of uh, mental health concerns as a result of the pandemic and what's going on in the world. And even before that, we, we had we had trouble. So this, um, you know, in, in, in particular, his capacity to bring a kind of create creative thinking, which may relate in some way to his having uh, kind of combining or bringing these two worlds together of art, music and uh, medicine and science, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but um, he, um, uh, he, I don't know if I mentioned it, but so after medical school, um, he actually decided to, to not go directly into residency, but to take two years to work. That's when he worked at the Boston Consulting Group in healthcare consulting. So really has a mind and is de developing his skill set in understanding and uh, transforming systems. So with that, I will now turn it over to, uh, to you, Chris, and we look forward to dialoguing with you. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm going to advance the slides. OK. So as John said, I am um, thrilled to be speaking today about care management and behavioral health care. And care management is a topic that um, is uh, uh, very important in healthcare today and across the different um, sectors of healthcare across behavioral health, across um, uh, physical me medical health as well. And so look forward to speaking about this very important topic. These are my disclosures. Our objectives today first is to define care management and related service models. Second, to understand the existing evidence supporting the use of care management and behavioral health care. And third, to identify future directions for care management in behavioral health care, both in terms of practice and implementation, as well as in, in terms of research. 
The big question for today may boil down to does care management work? And uh, that aligns with objective number two around the evidence supporting or not supporting the use of care management. And um, one of the key points I hope to leave you with today is that we really cannot answer this question without being very specific about these three other questions beneath it. First, what do we mean by care management? And not only what do we mean by care management, but what is the specific care management intervention we're interested in? Second, who is the patient population we're looking to use care management with? And third, what are the outcomes we're looking to address? Without clarity on any one of these three um, questions, we, we cannot answer the overall question of, does care management work? To reinforce this point throughout the presentation, I've put a tracker on the bottom right-hand corner of the slides to help orient us to what intervention populations we're speaking about and the outcomes as well. And so I will also verbally reinforce the, the um, where we are and exactly what the scope is um, throughout the conversation along these three dimensions. So what is care management? This is a term, again, that comes up frequently in healthcare today. There are a number of other similar seeming terms out there, case management, care coordination, care navigation, and others. This question was posed, um, I think articulately, by an author in the New York Times seven years ago. The article, The Tangle of Coordinated Healthcare, and she writes, who coordinates the coordinators? More specifically, who coordinates the proliferating number of healthcare helpers, variously known as case managers, care managers, care coordinators, patient navigators or facilitators, health coaches, or even, here's a new one, pathfinders. And I'll note that this article takes a somewhat skeptical tone to this, um, to this topic. And I wanna reinforce that that is not the point of today's presentation. But rather, my sense is that the skepticism arises from the fact that there is both a multiplicity of terms as well as terms that are not self-explanatory, so terms that are maybe ambiguous uh, upon face value. To define what care management is, myself and colleagues turned to a document from the national group, the National Academy of Certified Care Managers, and their content domains and care manager tasks. So I'll, I'll go through these right now. They, they list five domains. One, assess and identify client strengths, needs, concerns, and preferences. Two, establish goals and plan of care. Three, implement care plan. And I've highlighted the specific tasks that they list under this broader implementation of care plan domain. Four, manage and monitor the ongoing provision of and need for care and five, ensure professional practice and supervision of care management. To simplify and distill this down, we um, came up with a list of three, of just three elements. And simply those are assessment, care planning, and care coordination. And I think if you take a minute to look at the list of five at the top and see how those align with assessment, care planning, and care coordination, we felt this was uh, a simple way to define what is care management. And this also happens to align very closely with a uh, definition provided in a 1982 article about case management, which we'll go into in further detail momentarily. Um, I should also highlight that in terms of today's presentation, we can think of case management and care management interchangeably, although there are some uh, differences, uh, some nuances, and happy to go into that further later today as well. So when we think about the three elements of assessment, care planning, and care coordination, um, this is a, a broad definition, and we might think about what's missing. So both in terms of what's not included in assessment, care planning, and care coordination, and then also what are some of the um, what are some of the details that are not defined by that? So I'm gonna go through a list of three things that is, is, or is not clear from that definition and we'll come back to throughout the presentation today. 
One thing that is clearly not part of assessment, care planning, and care coordination is actual care. So the, actual, the direct provision of care or services is, is, not, is not encompassed by assessment, care planning, and care coordination. And in some ways, we might think, oh, that actually makes sense. People providing care in behavioral health care, say, might be a therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, a care manager is not directly providing that care themselves. However, as we'll see later on, the question of whether services or care are actually provided by the care manager is an important distinction that differentiates different models of care management um, and varies between and helps um, and varies between different models in terms of even what those elements of care are. Now, another thing that's not clarified by the definition of assessment, care planning, and care coordination is how the care manager fits within a broader team, um, whether it's a team providing that service or whether they are part of a, uh, let's say, standard provider team, for example, integrated with a therapist and psychiatrist or with a primary care provider. So this question of individual versus team or fitting into a broader team is another domain or dimension that I'll come back to throughout the presentation. And finally, there is no guidance provided around the contact logistics. So things like the frequency of contact, the duration of contact, whether it's in-person or remote, um, others. Um, this may uh, widely vary between models that all fit under the umbrella of care management. And there are other dimensions as well. Um, but again, these are three that I'll highlight that um, seem to in particular distinguish different models of, um, of care management and, um, and have explicitly, explicitly been called out in the literature on care management. So before we move on to talking about specific models um, in specific populations, I want to again reinforce that one takeaway is assessment, care planning, care coordination. That is really how we think of and define the triad of care management. For the rest of today, we'll uh, look at care management within two specific behavioral health populations. The first is individuals with severe mental illness, SMI, and the second is primary care populations with behavioral health conditions. These are populations in which there is extensive uh, history of research um, and experience with care management models. And it might strike you that these are in some ways populations on opposite ends of the spectrum. So on the one hand, um, severe mental illness, and then on the other, what might be uh, more mild mental illness, but very prevalent uh, conditions. And perhaps later today, we can come back to thinking about why is it that these are the two, uh, these are two of the populations in which there is that extensive uh, body of experience in care management. We'll start with the uh, population of individuals with severe mental illness. And for this, uh, an important piece of context is to think about the era of deinstitutionalization in this country, the, the massive closure of state hospitals. So that era saw the rise of um, one very important model of treatment, assertive community treatment, ACT. And here I've highlighted two key studies around ACT. One, uh, an important precursor study of what was called community treatment in 1973, and then the 1980 uh, first real study of ACT, what's considered the first real study of ACT, which at the time was called training and community living. And you'll see here the outcomes that these study authors found. So um, for this community treatment study at five months, more autonomous living situations, more autonomous employment, however, no significant differences in psychiatric symptoms. And then in the 1980 studies, they found uh, reductions in institutionalization, unemployment, ER utilization, and global illness. They also found a net economic benefit, a total societal cost reduction of uh, about $400 per patient per year. It was at the same time that uh, so we saw in the field the rise of case management. And in this 1982 paper, um, the author described the context for this. So he says, in response to a sprawling 
fragmented network of services. There was widespread interest in service, services integration techniques, especially case management. If you look at the table on the right, the um, what he calls the minimal model, you can see aligns closely with that triad of assessment, care planning, and care coordination. So he, he uh, defines it as outreach, client assessment, case planning, and referral to service providers. But he makes the point, um, as uh, I've already noted, that there's actually a wide range of what services might look like within care, care or case management beyond this minimal, law, minimal model. And so in what he calls the comprehensive model, there are uh, many other elements to what the case manager or care manager does. And I've highlighted a few that align with that direct service component. And he calls them direct casework, developing natural support systems, crisis intervention, among others. You might be wondering, why are we talking about ACT in a presentation about care management? And really, it's that even though they uh, might seem like very different things, um, these models, case management, care management, and ACT, really lie on a spectrum of what uh, broadly might be considered community care. And so in this 1998 uh, systematic review by Muser and, and colleagues, they defined uh, six different models of community care, including ACT, as well as um, some less intensive forms of case management. And here in this table, they've highlighted a number of different differences between those features of the intervention um, and uh, aligning to those domains of direct service, the team element, and logistical aspects of the contact with clients or patients. Now, this was a systematic review, so not designed to make a quantitative synthesis about effectiveness of any of these models. Um, for that, in 2017 was an updated meta-analysis from the Cochrane Group on actually a combination of assertive community treatment act, as well as what they called intensive case management. And I'll now dive into that study, as well as a meta-analysis that myself and colleagues performed on essentially everything else. So the, the non-intensive forms of care or case management um, for this population. Starting with the systematic review and meta-analysis of intensive case management plus ACT. Again, these were grouped together. Um, let me first highlight how, how the authors thought of this intervention, again, which they, um, in which they lumped ACT into the broader bucket of intensive case management. So in the, actually in the plain language summary, they define intensive case management as it consists of management of the mental health problem and the rehabilitation and social support needs of the person concerned over an indefinite period of time by a team of people who have a fairly small group of clients, fewer than 20. 24 hour help is offered and clients are seen in a non-clinical setting. So in that definition, you can see embedded several of those dimensions I had referenced, the team element, several aspects around the logistics of the, uh, of the contact, such as 24 hour availability. And in regard to caseload, they actually used a formal cutoff of 20 or fewer um, patients or clients per, um, per case manager to define intensive case management. In terms of the outcomes they saw, com when compared to standard outpatient care, they found a significant reduction in hospital days by about one day per patient per month or a little less than that, reductions in death by suicide, reductions in study dropout, which we can consider also dropout from outpatient care, reductions in unemployment, but no significant effects on mental state or status, quality of life, or healthcare costs. I'll highlight that the relative uh, risk of um, the, in the ICM or ACT group is substantially lower than that of the standard care uh, group. So not only statistically significant, but 30% uh, or thereabout reductions in death by suicide, study dropout and unemployment. In this article, they wrote that 
we currently know of no review comparing non-ICM with standard care and reporting relevant outcomes. So this was one of the inspirations for our group to look into this question of non-intensive case or care management um, in the population of individuals with SMI. So we defined non-intensive care management as a non-team based model. So an individual uh, care manager, unlike in the ACT team model. And we had no caseload restriction, neither a minimum nor a maximum. In regard to outcomes, we found significant reductions in psychiatric symptoms, improvements in global and mental quality of life, a significant reduction in total psychiatric hospital days, but no significant effect on total number of hospitalizations. And then based on a small number of studies each, we did find both greater patient satisfaction as well as to a greater total healthcare costs, inclusive of the care management intervention. Thinking about not only the statistical significance, but also the magnitude of the effect, um, the standard mean differences, the SMDs, which were uh, Hedges G values, uh, are all in the low range. So a standard mean difference of under 0 0.3 is considered a small effect. So these effects are all certainly small. And I'll pause here to also uh, invite you to, to look at the list on the right and the list on the left in regard to the outcomes and some of the differences in the outcomes um, demonstrated between the two studies. As part of our review, we also performed a qualitative systematic review of what the interventions, the care management interventions in the non-intensive bucket actually looked like, given that we suspected and imagined that this was actually quite a heterogeneous group of interventions um, for, the, for the population. So along the lines of the dimensions that I mentioned in regard to direct provision of services or care, we found that the majority of studies involved some provision of care or service. So that included things like psychoeducation, counseling on treatment adherence, counseling on general medical health, crisis intervention, and other skills or self-management training. Indeed, um, accordingly, we also found that in the majority of studies, the care manager was a clinician, so most often a nurse or social worker. In regard to the team element, I already mentioned that we were defining this non-intensive care management as, a, as an individual care manager model. But in regard to whether that person was integrated into the broader outpatient psychiatric team, we found that to be the case only in a minority of studies. Finally, in regard to contact logistics, we saw that every study involved some, some sort of in-person contact with patients or clients. And the average duration of the intervention was 16.3 months. We also did look at whether the intervention involved not only care management, but also some broader social service support or coordination around things like housing or, or employment, and found that that was indeed the case in the majority of studies as well. Lastly, we also looked at whether the study authors defined or named any specific model of care or case management that they were aligning the intervention to. And these are, um, Examples of models, the clinical model, the strengths model, the rehabilitation model, these are examples of models also named in the Muser systematic review I mentioned a few uh, minutes ago. Um, and these were indeed named in several of the studies, but generally study authors did not claim any strict fidelity, but rather that these were models that were more of a paradigm that um, the intervention in the study itself was perhaps most closely related to. One note about these intervention characteristics is that we were limited, of course, by what was described in the manuscripts. And we did attempt outreach to authors to clarify when it seemed ambiguous. Um, but we imagine that in, in actual practice, likely um, there was more uh, involvement of some of these activities than was necessarily put on the paper in the manuscripts. So likely with things like direct provision of services or care, or with social service coordination, we would guess that care managers were more often doing this than was necessarily reported. So I'll, I'll now um, pause for some conclusions around um, the, this uh, broader 
uh, topic of care management for uh, individuals with SMI. So in regard to the intervention, even when we looked at so-called non-intensive care management, there was clearly a substantial amount of clinical involvement. So direct service provision or care, a clinician as the care manager, and in-person contact. And perhaps this is not surprising given the complexities and challenges of uh, working with individuals with SMI. But one clear difference between um, non-intensive care management and ACT or ICM is the team element. So not only the team model of ACT and ICM, but the integration of the care manager within a team or not. We also might want to reflect on some of the differences between the outcomes demonstrated in ICM versus in non-ICM. And might it be that these reflect different underlying objectives between the interventions? So with ICM and certainly with ACT, when we think back to that history um, surrounding deinstitutionalization, the uh, objective of community living or really social function was a primary objective. Whereas for contemporary care management, and I'll note that in our systematic review, the majority of studies have been published in 2010 or later. Um, in contemporary care management, it may be that really clinical objectives around uh, management of the, the psychiatric illness um, take, take uh, precedence. So symptom reduction, quality of life improvement, et cetera. Finally, I wanna make a note about um, interpreting cost outcomes. So first, there is a difference between total societal costs and total healthcare costs. In that first study of ACT, they found a reduction in total societal costs. In the um, Cochrane Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of ACT and ICM, they found no significant differences in health, total healthcare costs. And in our Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of non-ICM, albeit with a very small sample, we found a significant increase in healthcare costs. And there is a difference between total societal costs and healthcare costs. Um, in the original ACT study, they actually encompassed total healthcare costs within total societal costs. And total societal costs included things like the, um, the costs of deferred employment or uh, lost productivity, the costs of the criminal justice system, et cetera. I also want to reinforce that total cost um, increase is not the same as cost ineffectiveness. So a cost increase with a, a, a large enough um, uh, clinical benefit would be considered cost effective. And none of the studies that I mentioned uh, were looking at cost effectiveness. So these are, this is an important distinction to highlight here as we think about cost. All right. I'm now going to move on from the, um, this first population, the individuals with SMI, and move on to the uh, second topic, which is um, individuals in the primary care setting with behavioral health conditions. So I want to first provide some rationale for why we're talking about primary care-based uh, care management for behavioral health. Primary care providers provide the majority of physician treatment for psychiatric disorders in the US. Screening for psychiatric disorders in primary care is both routine and recommended practice. And here in terms of recommended practice, I'm thinking specifically of three United States Preventive Service Task Force recommendations around the screening for depression and substance use in primary care. And comorbid medical and psychiatric conditions are associated with uh, greater burdens across a range of uh, dimensions. So greater symptom burden, greater functional impairment, decreased length and quality of life, increased costs. Before we dive into care management um, for behavioral health conditions in the primary care setting, I also want to provide some context on the extensive history and literature uh, uh, surrounding uh, care management of medical conditions in the primary care setting. And certainly there uh, is too much for us to really summarize in this sitting right now, um, but we'll highlight a few studies and want to emphasize uh, a few points about this body of work. So one is that 
um, often there is a objective around cost containment. And that is one that has driven um, some, uh, a large amount of the medical care management uh, efforts. And second is that toward that objective, uh, results have been mixed. And so the studies that I'll describe now um, are indicative of those broader points. So the first is a very large study of actually 15 different individual studies of what they described as chronic condition care coordination, although really more than just coordination, um, true care management in uh, the Medicare population. And the results of this study were overall disappointing. So inconsistent, and that's, that's probably also uh, not really, that's probably an overly um, uh, ambiguous word, but inconsistent impact on hospitalization. So in the majority of studies, no impact on hospitalizations. And in none of, none of the 15 RCTs, any significant reductions in total Medicare expenditures. And to the point of cost containment, this was a clear objective um, suggested even in the opening sentence of the article. Chronic illnesses pose a significant expense to the Medicare program and a major detriment to beneficiaries' quality of life. More recently, in the era of um, accountable care organizations and value-based care, um, provider groups are taking on not just clinical accountability, but also uh, accountability over cost. And so uh, a number of studies have come out more recently around care management in this uh, era. One study from Massachusetts looking at a pioneer ACO did find um, significant reductions in hospitalizations, ED visits, and Medicare spending um, following the enrollment of patients in a care management program. And they actually found that these effects grew over time. So when they compared um, the first six months, seven to 12 months, and then 13 months beyond, the authors suggested that the, if, uh, the effects in these domains um, did, did were, were increasing. However, a, uh, another study from 2019 looking at 244 Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs, MSSP ACOs, um, found uh, less promising results. So when they looked at um, the amount of care management and coordination activities, they found no association with that amount with differences in quality indicators, hospitalizations, emergency visits, or 30-day readmissions. And in fact, they found that greater care management and coordination activities was actually associated with greater annual spending, not less. So again, um, want to reinforce sort of a history of um, cost containment being at least one of the objectives around um, implementing care management, as well as the fact that that has demonstrated some mixed results in literature to date. So as we turn to thinking about care management models in the uh, primary care setting for behavioral health conditions, similar to how I um, talked about models in the uh, individuals, individuals with SMI population, I will start with a more intensive model and then talk about less intensive models. So when we think about intensive models of care management in primary care surrounding behavioral health, um, we of course think of the collaborative care model, COCM. COCM is a model that has now demonstrated um, effectiveness in uh, many, many studies. And to summarize the way that this model works, um, it is a team-based model. So there is a care manager, a behavioral health care manager in this diagram on the bottom left of the triangle who works with the patient as well as with the PCP who's at the top. There's also a psychiatric consultant, a consulting uh, psychiatric prescriber who advises the uh, primary care provider on psychopharmacology management of the behavioral health condition and works as part of the team as well. And that individual is on the bottom right of the, of the triangle. So uh, needless to say, um, in terms of those kind of dimensions of what differentiates different forms of care management, clearly this is a team-based model. Um, and in fact, that is highlighted as um, the first of the five principles of COCM that the COCM group um, uh, puts out there. And so that is one. And then when we think about some of those other uh, dimensions, we can clearly see that the COCM model makes a stake in terms of uh, which direction COCM goes. So COCM in regard to contact logistics um, 
describes population-based care in which there is uh, both registry-based management of the patients who are in this model of care and also proactive outreach to patients. So um, that suggests that there is not just contact where patients come to see a provider or a care manager, um, but there's actual act proactive outreach to the patient. And there is a clear element of direct service as part of COCM. So the care manager is providing direct evidence-based care as, uh, as described by the COCM group. And they specifically call out um, three elements to this problem solving treatment or PST, behavioral activation and CBT. So in this model, clearly the care manager is not just um, providing care coordination, but actually a uh, provider of care as well. COCM is, um, as we've just gone through, a, a very well-defined model of care, again, a very intensive model um, and intensive along those three dimensions that we just spoke about. But I actually want to now go through three different studies of COCM and demonstrate how um, there are differences in the CO, how the COCM intervention has been studied, different populations that they've been studied in. And we might think about hypotheses of you know, how does this affect differences in outcomes between the studies as well? So again, even though COCM is a well-defined model, there are still differences in how COCM could be implemented. The first major study of COCM was the impact study. In regard to population, this was a study of older individuals with depression. And there was a COCM intervention that uh, aligned with really the diagram that I uh, just went through. So um, a st stepped care of problem solving treatment by a care manager and or antidepressant management with a consulting psychiatrist. They found favorable outcomes in the COCM group uh, in, uh, in, in regard to depression across response, severity, and treatment satisfaction. This study also found a four-year um, total healthcare cost savings uh, around um, $3,363. This was not statistically significant at the p-value of 0.05 level, although the authors make note that there was a trend towards significance. Uh, and I'll also make the point that this is actually the study um, that is uh, referred to when people say that an investment in uh, mental health or behavioral health or psychiatry leads to total medical, medical cost savings down the road. So the intervention, COCM, um, they estimated cost around $500. Um, in that first year. And then uh, four years later, there was a six-fold return in terms of cost savings. Um, again, it was not statistically significant. And then I also want to reinforce that this was at the four-year mark. So the authors in this paper um, show that actually in the first two years, none of these cost savings were visible. The second study of COCM that um, I will go through is the Pathways study. So uh, already this was a study looking at a different population. This was a study of individuals with both depression and diabetes. The intervention was similar to the, the intervention in the impact study, a COCM intervention with both uh, stepped care of uh, problem solving treatment with the care manager and or that antidepressant management with the consulting psychiatrist. In the study, they also found favorable outcomes in regard to depression. They did look at differences in um, A1C at one year, and they found no significant difference between the COCM group and the standard care group. Um, so they were looking to see if there was going to be that effect on, from the medical side um, on diabetes management, and they did not find it. And the third study um, I'm going to highlight now is the team care study. So this was um, a study in 2010 looking at um, uh, yet a different population. So individuals with depression and either diabetes and or coronary heart disease, but not just diabetes and or coronary heart disease um, in general, but specifically poorly controlled diabetes and or poorly controlled coronary heart disease. And the intervention here was, was different. So there was that depression COCM, but the, the care manager in this intervention was actually performing both care management for both depression as well as the medical conditions. Um, so the care management included an active management component around diabetes and coronary heart disease, as was relevant to each patient. 
And in this study, they indeed found um, favorable outcomes in regard to depression. And they also found statistically significant outcomes in regard to um, medical conditions, a greater A1C reduction, a greater LDL cholesterol reduction, and a greater systolic blood pressure reduction uh, in the COCM group with this hybrid depression and medical COCM, as well as um, uh, when compared to the standard care group. Again, before moving on from the slide, I wanna emphasize that even within COCM, there are different levels of um, interventions. And we might think about uh, how the population selection intervention um, uh, might, we might hypothesize how that relates to the outcomes seen. So we went through now a few studies of COCM, again, which is, uh, we might think of as a very intensive um, model of behavioral health care management in the primary care setting. What about other models that are less intensive? So I'm going to go through two studies of uh, specifically remote care management. So remote meaning no face-to-face -face contact. And um, before talking about the studies, why, why would be why would be uh, we be interested in this? So one, of course, I think we we all can relate to in the setting of the pandemic, um, remote care, remote behavioral health care. Uh, we all uh, have a lot of experience with. So that is one. And then second is that there is an extensive uh, amount of both research as well as actual practical experience in remote forms of care management. So um, it uh, it is. Um, for those two reasons uh, of interest to get a sense, does remote care management actually work? The first is a study uh, just published about remote COCM. Um, and so in this study, they, uh, they found, it was a systematic review only, they found nine, nine specific studies of remote COCM. And uh, the authors explained that the, these nine studies covered different um, psychiatric conditions, depression, anxiety, PTSD, the intervention included a COCM team, plus or minus some other members as well. They found that in these interventions, the patient contact was primarily by telephone. There was some other electronic communication like email, and there was no video contact at all between uh, the COCM care manager and um, the patients. The authors in this study were quite, uh, suggested that the outcomes were quite favorable from the nine studies they found, and they felt they they explained that the studies suggested effectiveness across symptom reduction, quality of life improvement, and patient satisfaction. But what about not COCM? So COCM still, even if remote, is a pretty intensive model of care. What about um, uh, an individual care manager who's working? Um, uh, not, not as part of a, a broader care management team. So toward that question, myself and colleagues looked at, um, looked, uh, at, at uh, studies that were um, performing care management for comorbid behavioral health and medical conditions. And we looked specifically at populations of older individuals. Um, we uh, identified six studies. And in regard to the intervention and outcomes, we, um, I'll go through those uh, different um, intervention dimensions that I mentioned earlier. So in regard to the direct provision of services or care domain, we found that in these studies as well, the majority of studies involved some element of direct provision of service or care. So activities like counseling around medication adherence, disease self-management, or self-care. Half of the studies also included some medical health direct provision as well, uh, component as well. And those studies also all looked at medical outcomes too, which I'll get to in just uh, a minute. In regard to team uh, integration, now again, all of these studies had an individual care manager working uh, independently around the care management, but whether the care manager was integrated into a broader, say, uh, primary care team, that was the case in only one of the studies. So. Um, in a study based in the VA, the care manager was part of that broader um, outpatient primary care team. Uh, in the other studies, that was not the case. In regard to contact logistics, all, stick, all six studies involved telephone-only contact uh, and no video contact and no other forms of electronic communication with the patient. And 
The majority of studies also were fairly short. So looked at a six month or uh, shorter duration, both for the intervention and follow-up. In regard to outcomes, I'm gonna break it down, um, again, being intentional uh, between the different outcome domains. So between psychiatric, medical, and then cost and utilization. In regard to psychiatric symptoms, um, there were favorable results in at least, or in four of six studies, at least for some of the psychiatric uh, symptoms that the studies looked at. And two of the six studies demonstrated consistent um, uh, improvement or benefit for the care management intervention um, across the psychiatric symptoms that were studied and reported. In regard to medical outcomes, the results were more mixed. So of the three studies that looked at medical outcomes, again, all of these three studies involved some medical component to the care management as well. Um, in those three studies, only two of three had some improvement in some of the medical um, outcome domains that they were studying, but none of the three studies demonstrated consistent improvement um, across the, um, the medical outcomes. And finally, the two studies that looked at healthcare costs and hospitalizations found zero impact across any of these outcomes. So let me summarize some um, conclusions here about the broader topic of care management for behavioral health conditions in the primary care setting. First is that um, similar actually to in uh, the SMI population, even in primary care, the evidence base for care management um, in behavioral health conditions is primarily of models with that substantial uh, clinical component, with substantial direct service provision and care. And that's true not just in COCM, but even in non-COCM, so in individual care management as well, or standalone care management. It seems that remote care management does show promise for addressing behavioral health symptoms in behavioral health conditions. And that is also true in both COCM and in, again, standalone care management. But in regard to other outcomes, uh, we uh, the, the conversation is more uh, nuanced or complex. So when we think about medical outcomes, it seems like one takeaway is to think um, intentionally about whether to include a medical element to the intervention. And if we're thinking about doing an intervention that includes both a behavioral health, health element as well as a medical element, that means the care manager must be sufficiently trained and feel like they have enough clinical background to address both behavioral health issues as well as medical issues. So that is, a, um, that is an important uh, um, uh, kind of restriction to keep in mind um, when thinking about an, inter an intervention like the one in team care, where the nurse care managers were providing care management for both depression as well as uh, diabetes and coronary heart disease. And then in regard to cost and utilization outcomes, overall, these really still remain elusive uh, and not, um, uh, not, not something that we can be certain about. Um, and and, and uh, regardless, we uh, should expect that they, take, they may take years to manifest. Um, so that was the case in the um, in the impact study. That was also the case, as I mentioned, in that pioneer ACO study from Massachusetts as well. Some broader conclusions about care management in general in behavioral health care. So again, I want to reinforce this core definition of care management as assessment, care planning, and care coordination, and not necessarily including direct care. Um, but there are several key features that distinguish different forms of care management. So even with care, care management being assessment, care, care planning and care coordination, um, that still leaves a very wide spectrum of different kinds of interventions that meet that definition. And in regard to that direct provision of services or care, at least today, the existing evidence for care management and behavioral health uh, really is around clinical models that, that include that uh, element of care. It does seem like telephonic models of behavioral health care management show at least some promise in primary care for addressing behavioral health symptoms. And I wanna reinforce this point about um, targeting outcomes intentionally and thinking about how those tie to the intervention and even more fundamentally to the objectives of 
even coming up with the intervention in the first place? What is the ultimate goal? And a few future directions for this broader topic and work. So one important question in uh, care management research and maybe in uh, research around psychosocial interventions more broadly is, what are the active ingredients? So one hypothesis I have on the page um, is, is there some connection to some of those elements of COCM? Is it the principles of COCM that for COCM are what underlie its effectiveness? Is it the uh, patient-centered team care, population-based care, et cetera? Even within COCM, is it something else? Is it something more concrete and um, operational? So in that systematic review of remote COCM interventions, uh, the authors posed a list of what they called process measures. So um, these concrete things that might happen in the course of COCM that they wondered might be associated with effectiveness. That's listed here. But stepping outside of COCM, you know, we, uh, there are a lot of other models of care management out there. Can we try to apply some of these to those non-COCM or standalone forms of care management too? I would, I would uh, posit yes. You know, I think most of these things are things we can think about trying to apply um, uh, or at least test a hypothesis in, uh, in uh, these non-COCM standalone care management models too. And then more broadly in terms of future directions, uh, along the lines of figuring out what are those active ingredients, um, it, would be, uh, it would be helpful to have a standardization of how to describe and categorize care management interventions that would facilitate the comparison of, and even the description of, the communication of different models of care management. There's clearly, more work to do around exploring the use of technology in care management as there is across other aspects of healthcare too, whether that be video, text message, email, apps, et cetera. And I'm gonna reinforce again this point around what are our objectives um, when we think about interventions, what we do, the care we provide to patients. Uh, is it a behavioral health objective? Is it, is it a psychiatric objective? Is it a medical one? Is it a social or societal one? Is it around costs? And if so, what scope of costs or cost effectiveness? Is it some combination of the above? Um, it feels as though continuing to clarify this and as it may evolve or may be different in different situations can only help us as we think about the future of behavioral health. And with that, I will end and um, some acknowledgements to my co-authors and uh, to the a medical Library at Harvard um, for their help with this work. Fantastic. Um, and I'm going to um, facilitate here. I know that uh, Dr. Siniscali has a question. I see Karen Blank has, uh, has written one in there. And, uh, and I'm going to, uh, I don't know if you want to take your slides down, Chris, that way we can see each other a little bit for those that can be on camera. Um, so just first of all, thank you for, for the work that you're doing um, in, in this area and for breaking it down for us. It's something that we, it's a topic we sort of think we know about and take for granted, but then if you actually look at it, we, we throw a lot of terms around, but don't really know what they mean. There's a lot of energy about this in the healthcare system, um, you know, in part coming from other disciplines like um, like cancer care and that sort of thing, and a lot of sort of pressure in the system to follow suit. Uh, it also makes me think of uh, Tom Insel's new book, um, you know, basically lamenting his time at NIMH was spent spending money on things that didn't end up bearing fruit in terms of outcomes and quality of life. And, and, and maybe I'll ask you a question about whether we should be shifting our research in a different direction. So actually, um, since uh, Dr. Blank wrote a, an eloquent uh, question, I'm gonna read that one first, then we'll get to Scott, and then I see a hand on CPU uh, 11254. So, so Dr. Blank says, um, thank you for this thought-provoking presentation. I'm struck by how the data presented is missing family outcomes. I suggest that if uh, the outcomes were broadened to include family, more favorable impacts would be evident. 
Can you, can you please comment on the benefits of care management on family outcomes such as caregiver stress, quality of life measures, maintenance of family involvement, and financial impacts on the family? That actually echoed a thought that I, a question that I had um, along the way, just in our experience hearing from so many families. I'm thinking here of parents of young adults saying, I don't know what's going on. I don't know who to talk to. And when they have a team to talk to, that tends to get better. So thoughts about the, this question? A great question. And, and um, I guess my short answer is I uh, agree. And, uh, you know, at least for today, uh, don't, uh, don't feel like I can uh, speak with certainty about uh, those, those outcomes, whether, meaning whether they are um, uh, affected um, significantly or not by any of these interventions. However, I completely agree. And I think it's true in both populations we talked about today, meaning both, this is an important question, both for thinking about families of individuals with SMI, as well as thinking about um, uh, family members of individuals seeking behavioral health care in the primary care setting. And the reason I think in particular that that applies in the, the second case is in our systematic review of remote standalone care management, we looked at restricting the population to only individuals who are older. And I can just say from having done the actual systematic review and gone, having gone through many titles and abstracts that there is a substantial body of work around um, looking at care, not only caregiver outcomes, but in fact, uh, interventions oriented at the caregiver specifically for, um, for when the patient is specifically themselves an older person. And uh, that is even true in uh, narrowing that even further, that's true even um, meaning uh, looking at specifically populations of uh, patients who have uh, dementia or other cognitive impairment and the, the caregivers of those individuals. So that research is out there. Again, I don't feel uh, I can speak to it uh, with certainty right now, but I uh, agree it is an important factor to consider. And certainly with the, with the aging population, uh, I think it goes without saying. You know, and just to expand on that a little bit, I mean, part, part of the question, I, I think for me, at this point in my career, and given that I've been in leadership roles, I, I'm trying to think it's at least a dozen, if not two dozen, probably, you know, sort of business leader type folks have approached me over the years saying something like, I don't get this behavioral health thing. You know, when my family member had cancer, um, all of a sudden, there was a team of people um, helping us navigate, you know, the word that they use, uh, having a navigator. And the experience of that is, and why, why can't we do something like that in behavioral health? So it's interesting. Um, I wonder, even in the team care um, studies, I wonder, I wonder if we, we were able to get a sense of whether the patient um, experienced being treated by a team, or whether that was something that that uh, was just happening that they didn't really necessarily um, experience. Also wonder about, um, you know, the, the, the patient satisfaction. Uh, but let's uh, switch to um, Scott. And Scully, I see you there, you wanna unmute? Yeah, that'd be great. Chris, this was wonderful. I think it was a really encompassing um, guide for how we've got to where we are with case, case management and care management and both behavioral health and primary care. Um, as you know, I consult to primary care docs through the collaborative care model in our system. Um, and so we work side by side with medical care managers uh, in a lot of these primary care offices. Um, and I think personally, just I can kind of make comment and then ask you for some questions, um, that the main difference between the collaborative care model and the medical care management model is the involvement of the team-based approach with a psychiatrist sort of as the quarterback. Um, being able to diagnose and uh, direct treatment recommendations and also medications and labs. Um, I can tell you that we've gotten a lot of people into levels of care that I worry wouldn't have been done if I wasn't involved. Um, so I, and patients have actually made comments to what John just mentioned around um, the team-based approach and feeling a part of sort of a treatment home um, with the care manager, the primary care doc, and myself all being involved in their care. And I think they feel very supported and that helps with outcomes. Um, but I'm wondering if you are aware of any research comparing the collaborative care model to um, sort of uh, standalone care management in the medical setting. Um, and if you could also comment on the standards of care clinically for standalone care management, uh, that'd be helpful. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think this question of comparing both, there, there are three comparisons I think that, that uh, 
can be made based on the kinds of interventions or the, the categories that we've been talking about. So there's like intensive forms of care management, which I would consider COCM as in that bucket. There's maybe non-intensive or standalone forms, and then there's just standard care alone. So we can think about the comparison between uh, something like COCM and standard care, um, standalone care management and standard care, but then also between the two different forms of, of uh, care management. And um, I am not familiar with research on that, looking at that third comparison. Um, in, in regard to the standards of care, I mean, uh, or, or uh, standards around standalone care management, it is not really a model. I mean, it, it, you know, it, in fact, I think the fact that it's not a model is, uh, is uh, demonstrated by the fact that there's so much ambiguity around what care management even is. And so it's only around things that have become formally defined like ACT and COCM where there is a standard and there's a, there's a team of people, there's a huge amount of momentum helping to um, disseminate and then also reinforce and perhaps specify and narrow down what it is. But outside of these uh, centers of gravity that have, that have gathered a lot of evidence, um, a lot of people doing the work, uh, it's really kind of uh, the wild west. So, um, you know, I, I actually feel like uh, some of my work, you know, some of the goals underlying the work was to help identify even ways to think about starting to apply standards. Uh, because I think identifying things like direct care, uh, the team element or team integration, and then elements of the, the logistics around the contact, those are just the domains. Now, then it's up to us to actually define what are the standards within each of those domains. Those are just characteristics that we can uh, identify and help point people to, to, to be very specific about when they are defining uh, or coming up with when they are testing new models of things like standalone care management. So I think that you know that is the direction I hope we can move um, in, in this work. It's a, it's a great question, Scott. And one of the, actually we had, were just in a conversation not, not long ago about um, um, you know because because in behavioral health are uh, what we're fighting against most most often is is non-consumption really is is not as people not getting care, you know of not having access to care. So you, you also do wonder even if um, you know standing up a um, you know not fully um, studied or um, articulated um, treatment model um, may be imperfect, but it, it may open up access to a whole new, just by virtue of starting something new, all of a sudden you start screening people, you know, and you start, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, Dr. Barescu um, has a question, which I'll read. Um, thank you for the eloquent uh, presentation. Can you comment on any data regarding impact of substance use disorders? Did you come across anything on substance use disorders and personality disorders um, in outcomes within COCM? Did that come up in, in any of your uh, work? I know they have looked at COCM across a range of different uh, diagnostic um, areas. I, I, uh, I don't wanna speak about uh, the specifics of what those studies have found, um, but I know at this point, COCM has been studied across a, a pretty wide range of uh, diagnoses. Daniela, did you wanna follow up to that? You're on. Sorry, yes. So the initial question was from the, the, the first difference so that where you showed uh, your study and a, a previous study where it seemed like severe mental illness in one was defined as uh, including severe personality disorder and in other not. I see. So uh, in regard to the def definition of severe mental illness, so you're right. I, I, uh, I know that was on the slide and I didn't verbally acknowledge it, but between the um, the Cochrane Review, the Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of ICM and ACT in uh, SMI versus our um, Individual Care Manager um, Systematic Re Review and Meta-Analysis in SMI, we had different definitions of severe mental illness. Um, so you are right, that, is, um, that, that was the case that we, uh, I'm actually gonna go back just to make sure I'm uh, speaking accurately, but the Cochrane authors looked at um, both 
psychosis and personality disorder for their definition of um, SMI. And then for ourselves, we actually looked at schizophrenia spectrum disorder or bipolar disorder. So, uh, and by, by all bipolar disorders, so not just bipolar one or bipolar with psychosis. Um, I think there's a whole other topic uh, and question around how we define SMI. Uh, maybe similar to thinking about how we define care management, it's a topic that could be an entire presentation of its own. Um, you know, and, and even in defining the population ourselves, we saw a range of different, um, uh, of different definitions between studies of SMI, you know, just in reviewing papers that we included into our review. To be specific, we required in our, in our review that, um, that only 50% or greater of the population in each individual study have schizophrenia spectrum disorder or bipolar disorder, given actually a lot of studies even included major depression, as uh, part of the SMI definition, personality disorder certainly as well. Um, so I will leave it at that. I mean, I think it's it is an, it's evolved um, as over time too. I think how SMI is defined, um, and uh, I, I know there's at least um, I think one review that I've seen out there of just uh, reviewing the definitions of SMI, you know, what goes into it versus what does not. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, have you had experience in your um, systems in collaborative care or no? Uh, no, that's the thing. We, I, my experience has been in uh, primarily outpatient-based practice with uh, no COCM. And yeah. uh, um, without the exception of the COC, the, the community management that we were helping patients with outside of any structured form of uh, intervention. So um, yeah, I, I wondered how much these uh, separate issues that are, that are always comorbid, substance use and personality disorder uh, influence outcomes. Yep, yep, excellent. Um, and uh, actually I have a question here. Uh, people actually can also email me or text me. That's the way we used to do it. And I got one from uh, Dr. Widener who had to step off for another meeting but she said a fantastic uh, presentation. She's interested, just to paraphrase, in given your you know, travels, Chris, in the medical world and in the uh, disruptive world and, and the insurance world, can you speak to the tension between the metrics that are important to each? You, you touched on this, I think, um, a little bit as it relates to cost of care. You know. She brings up uh, the issue of, you know, the tension between length of stay and readmission rates. You know, there's pressure to both reduce length of stay um, and reduce readmission rate when, the, you know, it, in certain circumstances, those things might be incompatible. Um, but given, especially given your work in, in, in some of your consulting, you know, how do you, I just, how do you think about, uh, you know, those Tensions. I guess there will there will always be tension. Does it matter who's driving the project? Is it you know? Do you think it will land on some you know kind of unified solution? What, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think the the question is kind of makes makes a great point, and I think in some ways the point speaks for itself, which is that there are different objectives, and particularly between let's say clinical outcomes versus uh, cost ones. Um, to, to make the buckets as large as possible. So clinical versus cost. And I, you know, I, I think it is very important for us, I'll just uh, reinforce to be intentional when we think about um, designing a program, implementing a new program, not even a new program, implementing a program, uh, we are clear what our objectives are. Um, I think we can all feel it's, it is okay for costs to go up, for cost containment to not be, um, the objective for everything, meaning healthcare will, for many things, just cost something. And um, if and if, if there if there are favorable clinical outcomes associated with that, that is okay. I mean that is true of uh, a lot of healthcare. Um, I think the history of care management um, being rooted in many cases, definitely not all cases, but in many cases around cost containment uh, means that. Uh, whether explicitly or implicitly, the cost containment objective was part of the picture. And so, um, you know, I think moving forward as we think about new interventions, uh, certainly implementing interventions that 
uh, aren't in place yet. Uh, whoever is involved in that and whoever is involved in uh, uh, making a decision, deciding to move forward, um, it be, be clear about those objectives. It's also okay, I think, if multiple objectives are present, uh, but simply being uh, transparent and making sure everyone's aware of that is seems critical. Yeah, I mean, I have to say your presentation has helped me kind of um, have an idea about it, which is um, something like um, cost reduction is would be great. I mean, it's always about clinical quality. Then cost reduction would be great. You know, cost neutrality would be good. And, and healthcare cost increase to some degree, you know, and it, with some full accounting of, of larger societal costs, you know, um, is still okay. Do you know what I mean? I think that that's a very interesting kind of way to frame it in terms of some, some guiding principles. So I, I think um, I had said before that CPU 1125-4W had its hand up, but that was just my cursor, which looks like a hand. Uh, so, uh, I, so it was my bad. I, I'm going to ask you maybe one more question because we're, we're up against time here. But you know, um, back to back back to the Tom Insel thing. So it's interesting to me that you're interested in this, Chris. You know, and and uh, and um, I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit because you know, even though you're early in your career, your your travels have taken you you know to some really important you know sort of landmark locations, you know, within the system. So, you know, is this, uh, and, um, you know, when you think of all of the billions of dollars we've spent on, on the, you know, the decade of the brain stuff, you know, and, and then we look at this and, you know, there's, there's definitely a good number of studies, but not, you know, hundreds and hundreds of studies of this kind of system, you know, implementation stuff. Is that part of what what drives your interest? I mean, are you is are you kind of uh, curious about whether you know this is the kind of you know uh, stuff that's really going to be transformative, or or what? Or is it just a passing interest? I would say it's more than a passing interest. I, you know, I think that uh, so, so one reason is care management is is a is a major tool being applied across the country. I mean, it's a um, and I think it takes many forms, even in, in places where we're, we're not aware of it. So COCM is a great example. I don't, I don't always think people are aware that COCM involves, or you could even say is a form of care management. Um, but it is, I mean, it is at the same time also very much a way of providing direct care too. Um, but across healthcare, across the uh, diagnos diagnoses, um, across, but also across the sectors of healthcare, care management is very much of interest. And, you know, I think the point I made earlier about uh, rising interest in the setting of alternative payment models in the setting of uh, the rise of accountable care organizations, that certainly seems to be the case as well. So it seems like a, a important topic for this time too. Um, one, one, I think, takeaway for me personally is to think about what is uh, needed to, what's, what's, the minimum or more or at least more than the more than the minimum needed to make care management really effective because um it it does seem that there are care management or even not even truly care management but uh forms of outreach to patients that are very minimal that may not really do anything and so there is a question to me about what's just enough like what do we really need to uh, what's enough contact between the care manager and the client or the patient and the team to actually make a meaningful impact clinically, you know, whether that's BH or medical or something else, or in terms of cost. Um, I, I think that is a very important question as given the numerous care management programs out there, I think everyone would want to know, you know what is the model that, what is, what is uh, the least amount needed to make a meaningful effect? And beyond that too, like what are increasing thresholds to have other kinds of effects that we'd want to have. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. So it, both in terms of efficiency to be able to scale, because that is the, the biggest problem, but also because you know when things get trendy, you know lookalike systems get set up, and if they're they're built with without knowing what the secret sauce is, it, it really just increases cost and 
inefficiently and doesn't you know impact quality so we are up against the the 115 so i and and a great timing i want to thank you again um chris for for visiting with us i only wish that we had one of your you know uh con con concertas or i'm not sure what the word is <laughs> one of you if we had some music of you playing the piano in the background as our exit uh, music but maybe next time and uh and you know i'm sure we'll be Staying in touch with you, so 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 great to see you, and, and many thanks, um, Paul. I guess we can stop the recording. Thank you, Dr. Santamajor.